form do the contacts happen? ¿En qué forma suceden los contactos? Eh, a mí hay una sensación muy especial que se me presenta a, a esta altura del plexo solar. There is a sensation concentrated in the plexus, in the solar plex of mm. his body. Es una sensación como cuando uno está fuertemente enamorado. It is a sensation very much like when you are uh, tremendously in love. Y esta sensación me despierta. And this sensation sometimes wakes him up at night. Y sé que voy a tener un encuentro con ellos. And he knows he's going to have an encounter with them. Sí. Eh, lo que me agrada de, de esta experiencia que he tenido. What he likes about this experience he has, he has had. Es que la comunicación que ha habido con ellos. Is that the communication they have been Having. Es como la comunicación que estamos teniendo tú y yo en este momento. Es just as we are now. So it is a purely physical contact. Es una physical. puramente física. Este, you bueno, can touch them. los puedes tocar. Los puedo tocar. Y en ocasiones ellos presentan un cuerpo de luz. Sometimes as 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 they are human like sometimes they have a, a body made of light Sometimes these ships appear in great altitude, coming down slowly to hover eventually over the ground in an altitude of one and a half feet. When it is still in great altitude, the movements of the ship are very unstable. But when it hovers over the ground, it is completely static. But it also happens that the ship suddenly appears right on this spot. For me, it's like a kind of magic. 
they come directly out of the light, slowly, part for part. Their body emerges out of this wall of light. Carlos has been having contacts for the last 18 years, but on, maybe only in two of them I had the consciousness that he was going to have a contact. So I was helping him to get dressed and to be warm so he wouldn't get sick. But in the other times, I didn't have no conscience. It was, it was like they put some spell on me so I wouldn't wake up because I'm a mother and mothers always wake up with any small noise. But uh, not anymore. I never notice when he goes to a contact. Twice in this last 18 years, I was aware that Carlos was not in bed. I woke up and he wasn't there. Uh, at the beginning, I just said, well, he might have gone to have a contact. So I was okay. I was feeling fine. I had never had the temptation to spy on him, never. I don't know. I am very curious and I really would like to know more about his contacts, but I never felt the need to spy on him. How did Carlos Diaz get involved into the subjects of UFOs? Why did he become a contactee? We wanted to learn more about his background and visited his parents and family. Yo recuerdo que sería alrededor de cuando tenía yo siete años, cuando yo era niño. I was very little, around seven. It was at Christmas or the New Year. I'm not sure anymore. And we were coming back home from my grandmother's house. My father was carrying me and was protecting me with a blanket. I woke up in the arms of my father and looked at the sky and saw a round thing with a ring around it going from south to north over the city, Mexico City. What kind of um, child was Carlos Diaz? Was he special in any way? In what way? Was he interested in outer space, in UFO? He would ask for Christmas a, a, a uh, astronaut uh, hat. Sí, le pedía los Santos Reyes. Y robots, y and he would ask for robots. Y veía por las películas de... And he was always looking TV shows from space. Pues porque es una coincidencia que cuando él viene es cuando vemos en los hombres. Because how come it, 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 it mustn't be a coincidence that when he comes we can see the UFOs. Como que lo andan buscando. It's like they're looking for Carlos. I think he had contact since he was little without knowing it. And that's why he was so attracted by space. The incident occurred in the year 1979. En aquella época vivía en la casa de mis padres y It happened in 1979, very early morning, around 6.20 or 6.30 a.m. I woke up by a strange feeling in my solar plexus. I saw a light reflecting on the wall, and it entered from a small triangular opening the curtain left from the window. I got very curious, and so I got up and looked out of the window to see what was going on. 
When I opened the curtain very slowly, I saw up in the sky a yellow object, very much in the shape of an egg, which was suspended there. I shared the bedroom with my brother, so I called him immediately and said, Antonio, Antonio, come and see, there's a UFO. He put his blanket above his head and said, what, a UFO? I don't want to see a UFO. I want to sleep. So I kept on looking at the object for some moment, and then the object left with a very high speed. The next day I set the alarm clock for the same hour I saw the object that day, and I was waiting that it returns, and indeed I saw the object again, and after a few seconds the object flew away again. So on the fourth day, I had my camera ready on a tripod with a cord trigger. The object came from east to west over the city, and I was able to take a picture. I opened the shutter for four seconds. I was afraid it would fly away, and I captured it on film. I was very glad I did that, to have an evidence in my hands for my brother. No, eran 6.30 de la mañana. 6.30, no, no, no lo vimos. Nomás estaba emocionado. We didn't see him at the real moment because it was very early in the morning, but uh, after that he was very uh, excited. Sorprendido. And surprised. The one who was mostly shocked was Carlos' brother, who did not believe in these objects. He was awakened by Carlos, but didn't want to get up, because he didn't believe. So when he saw the picture, he was very surprised. The films and photos of the so-called ships of light taken by Carlos Diaz are considered by many UFO researchers the best in the world. Others rejected them as being too good to be true. The Mexican optical physicist and computer expert, Professor Quesada, is convinced that they're real. But this was just one single opinion. To verify the results of his analysis, we consulted leading experts in the US, Italy and Germany. The Village Lab in Tempe, Arizona is specialized in image processing and computer animated special effects from music videos and Hollywood blockbusters. Its director, Jim Dilettoso, analyzes UFO photos for 20 years and exposed several spectacular hoaxes. Still, the Carlos Diaz pictures impressed him. So concerning the Carlos Diaz picture, here's another thing to point out of note. If this is a small object with a beam splitter and it was close to the camera, we would find that the edges of the object down here would reveal themselves to be sharp like this, not distorted like this. No one test is conclusive. You have to take everything together, like going to the doctor who has blood tests and x-rays and a variety of tests that you put everything together and draw a conclusion. The fact that we have a distortion out here and sharp edges here is one factor, one factor, that indicates that this is probably not a small model in the beam splitter or superimposed. This has all the properties of coherent light, not diffuse light, not incandescent light, but coherent light, like a laser. The properties of the direct illumination and the properties of the reflected light are identical, as if the reflected surface did not absorb or diffuse any of the light. That's really strange. That's really strange. 
it's like the light is coming and, and bouncing off of that surface as if it's an absolutely precision polished mirror. No absorption or changing in the light characteristics at all. In fact, the brightness is almost identical. Um, these colors are not distorting and blending together. It'd be like having a red laser and a yellow laser right beside each other, and they are not blending, making a new color. In fact, uh, they are casting the image of this tree into the reflection here. And it is enlarging it as if this is a light source casting a projected image of the trees like a hologram onto the surface here. If Carlos Diaz is doing this as a hoax, he's figured out some very clever methods. It's easy for someone testing pictures to go, oh, it's a fake and he did it like this and like that. People that say it's a fake, they need to go do this. They need to figure out a way to do this and duplicate this picture. I can't figure out how it would be done with ordinary or even extraordinary tools and supplies that are around. We can use computers and test this thing forever, but there's some real basic things in optics and the characteristics of light that we don't need a computer to analyze those aspects of this. Try it yourself and see see what you get. It's, it's very unusual. Uh, I, I, I'm more interested in this picture than in most any other UFO pictures that I, uh, that I have seen, and it can't be easily dismissed. My conclusion at this moment is that this is an authentic picture of a very unusual phenomena, an unusual object. I don't think it's been faked. How big do you think it might be? I think this is a large object, larger than a bus or a tractor trailer truck, 40, 50, 60 feet. Because of its unusual uh, luminance, light characteristics, Robert Nathan is considered the father of image processing. He conceived it in the 60s and developed it ever since. He made NASA's Jet Propulsion Lab for the first in the field. The processor for all photos sent to Earth by NASA's both manned and unmanned space missions. Being a skeptic regarding the existence of UFOs, Dr. Nathan was the first address for us to consult. I, I've been presented this image a year or so ago, and I didn't give it any particular amount of time. Uh, my concern then, as now, is that uh, it should be easy enough to uh, establish from the reflection off of the hood of the car uh, the uh, reflection of the object and also of the guardrail, that one should be able to establish the precise distance of the object. If the object is claimed to be many meters away, it looks immediately obvious that the uh, parallax information, the, the change in the position of the object as seen off of the hood as compared to seen directly from the uh, direct line of sight from the camera is inconsistent with an object that is that has any distance. It looks as if there is some kind of model that was placed quite close to the railing of the uh, car and uh, some careful measurement will either bear that out or not. But that's a worthwhile measurement to make by somebody who wants to take the effort. Following Dr. Nathan's recommendations, we asked Diaz to take us to the site where he shot his pictures to verify the landscape details and measure the distances.
objeto se encontraba The object emerged beyond these trees. It was rising from the gorge and moved up little by little. We supplied first-generation copies of the original slides and the acquired data to three international experts in Italy, the US and Germany, who were willing to analyze the DS photographs and make the calculations recommended by Professor Nathan. The photos of Carlos Diaz are highly interesting. I tested three of them very carefully. They show a luminous object, red and yellow in color, ascending behind clearly visible reference points, behind a guardrail, bushes and trees, in front of a hill or mountain, in a landscape which it partially illuminates with its orange light. This object is absolutely real. It is not a montage. It is not projected into this scene. To find out if it is a small object close to the camera or a large object in some distance, there is a technique, the method of photodensitometry. We analyze the intensity of several areas of this luminous object and compare it with reference points in the image, for example with landscape elements. Based on this, we can state with certainty that the luminous object is located within the second level of the image, beyond the trees. In the foreground, you see the hub of the car and the guardrail, then the trees and bushes, and behind them, in some distance, we have the luminous object. Based on this distance and in relation to the other objects in this image, we calculate a minimum distance of 33 feet most probably much more. Therefore, the object photographed by Diaz must have had a diameter of at least 60 to 90 feet. I can only say that none of us, Rolf Dieter, Klein and myself, after analyzing the picture, found any indication of any known method to fake such a picture. We detected no strings, not even when we lighted up the background. No structures of any kind indicating a montage or any kind of manipulation. The object moved within the 15th second of the exposure upwards in a certain degree. Not smoothly, but rather in a jerky way. Our analysis has shown that it was not a simple, solid, metallic object, but the complete series shows the phenomena of a luminous plasma field, which was never before documented so clearly. It seems to be an object consisting of pure light, concentrated in a way that it forms a structured craft. The size must have been according to Rolf Dieter Klein and my own analysis, about 150 feet. It must have been a very large object. My conclusion? All available data indicate the authenticity of the picture with a certainty of 99%. The hypothesis that it might have been a forgery collapsed. I looked at the uh, picture both visually and on my computer uh, quite extensively and I cannot find anything in the picture that would make me think that it's a faked picture or a small model being photographed or a double exposure or any of the normal ways that pictures like this would be created if it was a create artificial creation my gut feeling is that the picture is probably the real thing when when a, a small object is photographed and then combined with a picture of trees and bushes there's always a fringing effect around the edge of the tree branches and so forth that it isn't the same as if you're photographing a real object. And uh, I didn't detect any of that 
fringing that would make me think this was a composite picture. And the trees don't look like miniature trees. I think they're real trees behind a real road guardrail. So I think the object itself is the size that it was stated to be and the size it appears to be. I would think the object would be something on the order of um, uh, roughly 20, 20 meters diameter, something on that size order. Back in Arizona, we shall deal with also the first films taken by Carlos Diaz in 1991. This is a still picture. And uh, I've looked at the video also. Like the still pictures, upon first viewing of the video, it looks very suspicious. It looks like uh, an object suspended on a pendulum and moving. But upon more careful examination, the object is moving slowly. Momentum and mass movement around a pendulum would have it moving in a more regular motion. My theory is, having seen other photographs and video of UFOs flying and moving, is that they tether themselves somehow in our atmosphere relative to the surface of the planet and the magnetic fields of the earth much like a boat with an anchor that that boat would be moving around the center point of an anchor they look like they're moving around a pendulum because they are but not because it's fake but because it's real we found the same wobbling movement of the craft filmed by Carlos Diaz in several other authentic UFO films, including those taken by astronauts of the space shuttle in 1991 in the Earth orbit. Toman eh, los cinturones naturales de energía del planeta because they take the, the energy belts of the planet y por momentos entran a ellos and, and sometimes they they travel in those belts but sometimes they jump out of the belt y se dejan ir por la energía and when they're in the belts they let themselves go uh, flowing with the energy y, y uh, si quieren ellos mantenerse en ese lugar están actuando un poco en contra del cinturón de energía uh, del fluir the, natural the de la energía flow of the of the belt. entonces por eso se ve so this is why you, los you brincos see que, how they, que hacen how they jump. pero en el momento en que eh, se dejan a ir de, se dejan ir con la corriente. But once they go and, uh, and flow with the energy, entonces uh, se van a una velocidad impresionante. Then they travel at a very, very high speed. But when we brought in the new films Diaz took in 1995, Diletoso was rather skeptic. 
tested the pictures in the early 90s and looked at still pictures in analyzing the edges, as I've done in blocking out the squares on this image, the properties indicated to me, because of the depth of field, that it was probably a large object. Now it's years later and I'm looking at video, motion video. A couple of things that I'm suspicious of are the ways that it moves. Now optically, the edges make sense that is probably a large object. Probably a large object. At different opportunities during my encounters, I experience how a beam of light shot out of the craft. This beam of light has the purpose to bring insects, plants, pollen, small and bigger animals aboard the ship. And sometimes we too, my friend and I, were brought aboard by such a ray. This beam directly forms and emerges from the ship and consists of the same light or energy as the ship itself. It doesn't exactly look like a large object when it's zoomed on by the properties of the edges. There are some confusing and disorienting things about it. The ray of light that comes down when we look at it frame by frame, the light on the ray comes on and goes off in the same way. It's darker at the top than it is at the bottom. In the first frame of the seven frames that the light is on, 14 fields. And it goes off the same way, with the, the top being darker than the bottom. See, this is the top, and this is darker, the luminosity is darker than the bottom. And it comes on that way, and it goes off that way. I found in each incident where the light comes on, that at this spot, this one, this one, this one, we have a little mark, a little pock mark, that looks like if it's a fluorescent painted stick, maybe it's a little bubble that was on the paint. When the object moves, it tends to wobble. Like maybe it's connected to this ray is the stick. If this were an extraterrestrial spacecraft, it might not be unusual that light can move top to bottom or bottom to top at a speed slower than the speed of light because the variance is between one frame, a thirtieth of a second. Well, if it was at the speed of light, we wouldn't even see it in a frame. It'd be off and then on. You see what I'm saying? Sure. It'd be absolute black in one frame, and a thirtieth of a second later, the whole frame would be on. Now, the coincidence that we might catch a frame in motion could exist, but for the fact that every single time that the ray comes on. It comes on and goes off identically the same way with it being the darkest at the top and the brightest at the bottom. Which is curious. So, I'm still trying to understand it. What the expert didn't know is that we already located an eyewitness for the very phenomenon Diaz has filmed. A Tepatzlan taxi driver on a night shift saw exactly the same orange disc when it was shooting rays down to the ground. It was oval shaped. Its colors were bright, yellow, orange and red and it was sending a ray down, a flashing ray, several times. It was static, it hovered, but it made slight movements in a vertical direction, then it suddenly disappeared. Anyway, we were still skeptical about the new footage, 
but since one of the films contained clear foreground data, it was easy to find out if it was filmed in the real nature or on a tabletop with the use of a miniature tree. We therefore asked Diaz to take us to the site where he took his film. In this night, I came here at about 3 a.m. when the ship first hovered right here on this side before it flew over the tree to come down on the other side. I set up my tripod, fixed the camera on top of it and begun to shoot when the object started to move up and down behind the tree. In order to get the best possible close-up, I zoomed in several times. This is how I shot the footage I gave you the other day. No film that just shows a luminous object at night can ever be conclusive unless it shows verifiable foreground data. But in this film, we have foreground data. The object is partially covered by the branches of a tree. Is it a large tree? We asked Carlos Diaz to take us to the site where he claimed he shot the film. He measured the diameter of the tree, the distance from the camera. We compared the zoom range of the camera and we shot a lot of comparative footage from the same perspective. In our studio, using false colors to enhance the image, we were able to uncover details on the film not visible when you just view it. We have the same shape of the tree, the same right angle between the trunk and the branches, the same extended branches on the right side, and the second round tree or bush right in front of it. Also, we were there years later this is enough correlation to say it was the same tree in the same perspective. Any possibility of a montage or blue box effect? No. There's a direct interaction between the object and the tree. The tree vibrates, obviously touched by the energy field of the craft. And the glow of the craft slightly illuminates both the tree and the bush. This footage is real. It shows a large craft, and it is one of the best UFO films ever taken. Soweit es geht. Stop. After a careful measurement, we found the tree to be 35 feet wide, with a distance of 345 feet from the camera. Therefore, the craft was at least 60 feet in diameter. But and the Carlos Diaz UFOs unique, never before seen anywhere on earth? No, they aren't. In 1965, Deputy Sheriff Arthur Strouch of St. George, Minnesota, photographed this disc-shaped orange-colored craft 
in the midst of a wave of sightings. On May the 4th, 1994, a cameraman of the local station, TV Roma, filmed this craft near Ostia, the ancient harbour of Rome. It was seen by hundreds of witnesses. In the enlargement, the same details are visible as on the Diaz films. Furthermore, little bolts of light are obviously dropped from the main craft, the same type of luminous spheres as they are regularly seen over Tepotlan. El mismo tipo de energía de la cual están formadas las naves más grandes these spheres of light are made from the same kind of energy the big ship is made of, light energy. Some are unmanned, some have one or two people aboard. Some of these spheres are white, others blue, others red in color, and they are probes or monitors to study the environment. They explore the different life forms and conditions on Earth, many things. They don't interpret, they just study and collect the data and emotions involved. Since they are energy, nothing can stop them. They can go through anything. They even come out of the rocks. Another film was taken on August 23rd, 1994, by Daryl Spence in Mansfield, England. Again, it shows an orange-reddish disc which suddenly lights up, just as in one of the Diaz films. What causes this strange luminosity? We still don't know, but one who might have had an answer was the late Colonel Philip Corso, a member of the National Security Council under President Eisenhower and head of the U.S. Army Foreign Technology Desk. When Colonel Corso saw the Diaz photos, he knew they're real. And he claimed he saw the same type of technology when he coordinated the study of the Roswell wreckage by the U.S. Army Research and Development. What you are seeing here, I told Diaz, is a flying saucer with his energy, propulsion energy, on and going someplace. Either it's going or, or coming or accelerating. I don't know because all you have here is a flat surface. So this is a, this thing is moving when it's like this because the energy is on. And he was he was very pleased to hear this because I told him the mistake that we have made. We built the type of flying saucers, but they would never fly most of the time because they made the mistake not realizing that the extraterrestrial is part of the flying saucer and part of the system himself, his energy guides the system. I told him that this, from our studies and our intelligence we had, these colors are part of the guidance propulsion system. So you are absolutely convinced the pictures are real? They're real. They had to be real, because he took the pictures and he had them. He never knew what this, well, he couldn't know an explanation like this. The explanation had to this had to come from something like I was in, research and development, knowing about what they were, knowing what the guidance system was, knowing the type of propulsion systems, and, and knowing what was in space. Otherwise, a nice fellow like Diaz would have never known this. He had to be saved maybe on the level that I was on. So when I told him this, he was really pleased and happy. And I told the boy, well, you did an honest job. You were an honest man. But more likely, you would have been attacked by debunkers saying, oh, you don't know what you're doing. But you had something real here and then never knew it. But it had to come from somebody that knew. So immediately when I saw it, I told Diaz what it was and explained it to him. 
The renowned physicist Professor Dr. August Mason worked for the Belgian Royal Air Force and teached at the Catholic University of Louvain. After he learned about the Diaz pictures and studied them, he was as stunned as Colonel Corso. As far as I see, there are no objections against it, and because uh, if it is true, it is very interesting for me in, as a confrontation with uh, a theory where one expected results of this type. I saw the pictures and uh, there is something uh, probably very different from what others did because I developed a theory uh, for the propulsion of classical objects. Classical objects are actually symmetric objects. And uh, it involves the system of how do they produce electromagnetic waves which surround the object. And uh, this is a very interesting subject and I'm happy to see that uh, one of the predictions of the theory, which is that, that you should be able to create, or they should be able to create, standing waves with certain modes where at certain regularly distributed places you have a higher intensity, thus you could eventually ionize differently, so you, if this theory is correct, you could expect that somewhere an observation like this will appear. For Professor James Hertog, the Carlos Diaz experience brings together the scientific and spiritual perspectives of the future and delivers a key to an interdimensional physics. Carlos Diaz documents are very important because they show a different category of intelligence, what could be called the bioplasmic form of intelligence that is even beyond the extraterrestrial which is using metallurgical or physical spacecraft. Here we have seen by computer enhancements of the film actual realities suggesting that this is a vehicle form that can change its shape, size, geometry in any number of ways. It comes close to what is called in the ancient documents of the prophets of the Western civilization, the Merkaba, or the vehicle of lights. In short, we are seeing in the Carlos Diaz material a whole new category of the UFO experience. We are going beyond the extraterrestrial into what could be called the ultra-terrestrial intelligence that is existing in a pure energy state. We are looking at a vehicle where there's no physical door, but has the opportunity to work with morphological energies that will open up a paraphysical door through which the contactee, in this case Carlos Diaz, will move into the vehicle, pass his physical hand through a body of energy, see no physical participants but feel an omnidirectionality of energy. This case merits more study because it signals a graduation of ufology into another category, that of the ultra-terrestrial beings of intelligence and will open a door to a whole new physics that will accept the possibility that there is a life so advanced that exists in a pure energy form capable of manifesting itself through superluminal light without a physical form. Is the Carlos Diaz ship of light an interdimensional gate? A projection from a parallel universe? An alien spacecraft? Why does it appear so frequently over the village of Tepoztlan? Is there any connection to the ancient cultures of Central America? Only the experience of a simple young man from Mexico might be the answer to all these questions. This is the first time that he invited me consciously to enter a ship. I saw how he was metía in this nebulina of light. The first time he invited me to go consciously into a ship, I saw my friend getting in first. He went through this fog-like light 
When more than half of his body was inside of the light, his body got sucked in into the object. So what I did first is that I put one hand into the light to feel, and to my surprise it went through the light and inside I felt a nice temperature. When I took my hand out, I was very relieved to see it was still in one piece. So that gave me the confidence to walk in, and when I had my body halfway inside the object, I was sucked into it too. But once you are into it, there is nothing you can see. You just see yellow light all over. You don't feel your toes, you don't feel the floor, but the sensation is very peculiar, because you feel very peaceful with a lot of love within you. Once when I came out of the yellow light, I realized I was not at the same place, but I was in a big cave. It had stalactites and stalagmites. And between them I saw several sculptures and ornaments which were of the art of the Maya culture. This big cave was the place where the ship hovered and there was a kind of path we walked through and we came to another cave and I saw there many people who were very kind to me and greeted me, very nice people, but the particular thing about this cave was that there were seven egg-like spheres of yellow light. After we got to this place, my friend stuck his hand into one of the eggs and took out a small bowl of light, also yellow, and said that this little bowl could project a ray that would touch my seventh vertebrae in the middle of the spine and it would take all the information which is in my neurons. Once I was there in this place, he invited me to go into one of those spheres of light or eggs of light. When I did so, I realized that all the yellow color changed and it was not yellow anymore but it was a scene of a forest from the air. It was like if I was flying, and then I saw on each of my sides a wing, the wing of an eagle, and I realized that what I was looking at was the information from an eagle, his memories that they had stored into this egg of light que me permitía ver el bosque desde el aire. Does Carlos' experience indicate a connection to the ancient culture of the Maya? one of the oldest and most mysterious civilizations on the American continent. The Maya were famous for their advanced astronomy, their precise calendar, their mathematics, which were superior to those of contemporary Europe, but also for the splendor and magic of their art and their mighty temple cities in the middle of the jungle. Today we are still fascinated by the mysteries of this culture and archaeology had yet failed to uncover its ultimate secrets.
Several researchers speculated about a possible extraterrestrial connection. Indeed, the Mayan mythology mentions that sons and elders of the stars teach their people in ancient times and speaks of 400 young men who visited Earth and later returned to the Pleiades. Once a Mexican investigator and journalist, while my good friend Jaime Musan asked me to ask them where they come from. So when I was with one of them the next time, we were walking near Mextitla. I asked him, where are you from? And he smiled at me and said, Look, Carlos, I can give you the name of any star, any constellation, any galaxy, but what would this tell you? As far as you've gotten is your moon. So it makes no sense if I tell you where we come from, since you can't go there and verify. For me, this answer was enough, even though, when I was with them, I once heard them to mention a star named Maya, and when I looked into an astronomy book, I found out that there is, in the constellation of the Pleiades, a star named Maya. Maybe this is where they come from, but I really don't know. The religion of the Mayas indeed was one which studied the cycles of life, the laws of nature, and the harmony with creation. They celebrated the fertility of the jungle in impressive ceremonies. The Mayan priests and shamans identified themselves and during their rituals became one with animals and plants, with the sacred quetzal bird, the free flying eagle, the busy ant, the fierce jaguar, or the wise snake. Is it a coincidence that a similar identification with the life forms of Earth in the mystery caves of the ex of life teach Carlos Diaz the necessity to work for a better world, to campaign for a living planet? Después de eso, eh, salí de la esfera o de este huevo de luz y pude entender que ellos han almacenado en estas esferas de luz muchísima, muchísima información, no nada más de seres humanos, sino creo que de... After entering these spheres or eggs of life, I understood that they store a great wealth of information in them, not just about human beings, but about all forms all manifestations of life. They don't only store images, they also store senses. When you are there, you feel like an eagle, like a bird. I felt joy, I felt fear, and I have seen many types of environments, the sea, the ice, jungles. What I have learned from this is that every living thing is important for this wonderful planet. They also offered to show me what they have stored about the past of my own life, but I didn't want to know, because what I want to do is to go forward and to try to act with all the things I have learned to live this experience. I had experienced that there is a wonderful interaction between all living things but this interaction went out of control. Every individual, every species, is an important part of this interaction. This is the reason why I want to share all this with the whole world, 
to invite the people to act in order to save the earth, to make it a true paradise for all living creatures and to inherit our future generations, a living planet. Es muy, muy, muy fuerte. Y creo que aquí me van a hacer compañía estos dos buenos amigos. Vámonos, chiquitos. Vámonos afuera. Vénganse. Vénganse. Vamos afuera. Afuera. Afuera, chiquitos. Acompañen. A un lado, si no, nos vamos a sacar todos. In this night in January of 1998, I woke up feeling this very sensation. It was just after midnight. I got up, grabbed my video camera, turned it on and left the house. I walked the short way to the football field next to my house, followed by my two dogs. I waited out there in the midst of the football field the camera is still running. Since I had nothing better to do, I filmed some stars and the moon as points of reference. And you can see that in the video. Suddenly the ship appeared just above me, a sea of light, yellow light all over. Seconds later I found myself inside of a very big dark cave. In some distance a ship appeared and disappeared again and again. Just above one great polished rock, nearly circular, on which an encarved image was clearly visible a triangle surrounded by three circles. A sign? The same symbol appeared in July 1991 in a wheat field near Barbary Castle, England. Its origin like those of others of the mysterious crop circles, was never satisfactorily explained. The triangle means the interaction between soul, body and mind, the harmony that should exist between these three states of a living being. And the small circles in every corner of the triangle mean the simple ring stands for nature, the circle of life. The one which looks like a wheel stands for movement. And the third one, the spiral, for the evolution of the consciousness of humanity, which in every mind grows like a spiral. And it all together moves into a higher state. It was meant to teach me exactly what I felt. This is how my experience takes place. They don't talk to me much. They make me feel things and be aware of things. And that's how I've been learning. Pero no azul de destrucción De bosques que han muerto de inanición Por desechos de mercurio de Blanco como garza cuando cruza los pantanos y blanco como espuma de las olas y la luna blanco como estrellas que se pierden en la inmensidad 
pero no blanco de destrucción, de detergentes y polución. ¿Cuántas cosas vemos sin solución? cielos se despliegan y verde como selvas de lagunas y reservas verde de delfines que jugando van cubriendo el mar pero no verde de destrucción de colorantes y combustión de seres extintos por Estamos viviendo un momento realmente histórico para la especie humana. Creo que tenemos que We are going through a very important state in the human history. We have to realize that the future of us and our planet is in our hands. The world is in the hands of a species which is very creative. We must make the changes with this creativity. We are already going through many transformations. This creativity does the transformations, but these transformations can be positive or they can be negative. And the negative ones are those which are destroying nature, the vitality of the planet. Las eh, dos partes de la creatividad del hombre nos daremos cuenta que está dominando más aquella que está acabando con la vitalidad del planeta. If we don't put into balance the positive and the negative things which we are doing with our own creativity, the negative side will get more and more powerful and destroy life on Earth. Lo maravilloso que es estar vivos y la maravillosa posibilidad que tenemos de actuar para poder seguir haciendo de este planeta un planeta vivo. Creo que es My intention in sharing this with you all is to invite people to act so we can keep working for life. I want to invite the people who want to listen, who want to see, who want to do something about it to work for life on earth so we can keep this earth alive. I don't share my experiences with the world to convince people of the existence of extraterrestrial life, but this experience has made me aware of the wonderful home we have. And I do believe that if we learn to respect and love life, the encounter with them will be inevitable. Indeed, it seems that the valley of Tepotzlan, a land considered sacred by its inhabitants even today, is like the eye of a hurricane an island of peace between man and the nature. Therefore, it doesn't really surprise that it also became a cosmic enclave, an outpost of those who ride on the oceans of the universe. It might very well be 
the place where contact between men and life forms from somewhere out there already happened, where they learn from us and we, maybe one day, might learn from them, a place where heaven and earth meet. And they come here because here in this very small place, Tepotzlan, are seven energy belts that cross here. And they use these energy belts to travel like we are using highways. That's why we have so many UFO sightings here. Therefore, it is so familiar to the people in Tepoztlan to see these objects because they have been here since a long time ago. And for generations, people in this place have seen UFOs over the hills. It's a very uh, magical place. It's very spiritual, it's very beautiful. It has traditions of uh, strong contact with the Aztec gods. Uh, it's, uh, it's kind of a spiritual cutting-edge place in the New Age community in Mexico. And there's a political element here, a kind of expression of um, not wanting to contaminate uh, their uh, environment with the uh, resorts, golf courses, uh, to avoid that. There's this kind of consciousness that they have something sacred here and that they don't want to have uh, um, undermined. Uh, so it's an unusual place and it seems somehow fitting that a man like Carlos should emerge in a, in a uh, place like this. Besides that, it is also because we don't have a great air force. There is no way we can bother them. So they are safe here. They can operate here, undisturbed, because of the great freedom in Mexico. I do think there already is an open contact. If the contact is not being done or signed by politicians, it doesn't mean there is no open contact. They do live amongst us, and they are here since hundreds and thousands of years. They are here trying to understand why we act the way we do. They have learned many things from us. They even admire us as a species because they say that we have evolved faster than they did as a civilization. But because of this hurry in our evolution, we do not really realize the damage we are doing to our planet in order to have more technology.
the activity of the volcanoes in Mexico and elsewhere in the world is just an answer to the aggression we are directing against the planet. All these nuclear tests have been done in so many countries, and now there's the answer to it, the volcanic activity which liberates the energy here in Mexico and all over the world. From 1991 up until now, many people have been reporting around the volcano activity of UFOs. And what is uh, really interesting is that this activity, it seems to be related to the activity of this very dangerous volcano. Many volcanologists think that this is the most dangerous volcano in the world because of its history and because there are so many people living very nearby this volcano. As they, they were fleets with five, seven, 10, 12 objects. We have even some pictures of that which prove very clearly that it's true. Uh, many other people uh, say that these objects have descent close to the volcano and uh, they have seen uh, even uh, extraterrestrials close to the chiefs. The sightings every time we're going to have activity of the volcano increase. For example, as I said in 1991-92, we found out that the volcano was active because there was so much activity. Then we have uh, a lot of activity uh, after the middle part of 1994. By the end of 94, we were predicting probably some possibility of eruption. And this happened on December 20, 21st, 1994. And then uh, on uh, September 18th, 1998, uh, uh, we were in Puebla and we had many reports of many witnesses of seven objects flying very close to the volcano. And we predicted new activity and new big eruptions. And from November 19th, 1998, we are living a new stage. Uh, we think is the final stage of this very dangerous volcano. This thing, this mountain could blow up, killing hundreds of thousands of people. It could become the biggest disaster ever in human history. Is that a conocer the experience lived by Carlos Díaz during 19 years with these seres called Luz? The purpose of the center is to make the material and message of Carlos Diaz available, material which has been collected for over 18 years now and has been verified by experts and scientists from all over the world. But it is also to help people which have seen for the first time a UFO, like me, as I was very shocked when I saw a UFO for the first time. The center wants to explain this reality to the people. De ese impacto que reciben la primera vez que ven un objeto no identificado. Eh, afortunadamente hemos eh, podido establecer una. The center, the organization we are beginning to open, will let people know about the reality of the UFOs and help in the preservation of life on Earth. E invitar a la gente a actuar como ellos han aprendido a hacerlo en favor de la preservación de la vida.